So, um, hello, Design Driven NYC. As Dan said, I'm Matt Strong. And I'm here tonight because I want to make design a team sport. So do me a favor, raise your hand if you are on a design team. Quick, a lot of hands. So we're gonna get a little, a little vulnerable here. Keep your hand raised if you agree with the following statement. I agree that design feels lonely. Design feels lonely. So this is how I feel about design. Been on lots of design teams, including most recently at the Wall Street Journal. Designing feels a little lonely. And so I've been thinking a lot about this, and I've been thinking about why design feels lonely. And one of the things I ruled out early is technology. I, I don't think that looking at a screen all day is necessarily lonely. If these people in the picture were playing um, League of Legends or StarCraft, they'd be playing the biggest team sport in the world. Uh, I believe that it's the design process that we use now that um, just, just is not conducive to teamwork. And I know a lot of you probably also feel this way, but by way of illustration, I'm going to walk you through a hypothetical. Say, tomorrow you come into work and uh, a colleague comes up to you and says, hey, uh, we need to update a mock-up, and the designer that worked on it isn't in today. Do you think you can take a look? So you say, yeah. You dive deep into the depths of Google Drive or the dark corners of Dropbox, and you find that designer's working file, and you open it up. It's chaos. This is my own design file, so no shade. But it, you see it's, it's you know rectangle, 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 copy of layer 13. There's three artboards that all look slightly different, but you're not sure which one is the most recent. There's a grocery shopping list in there for some reason. And so if you're like me, you open up other designers' work, and you feel like this. You have no idea what you're doing. You're floating through space. You can't make heads or tails of things. Based on the great reception to that pun, I'm going to guess that you all feel similar to me. Heads or tails, it's a dog. Um, so the reason why design feels lonely, one of the reasons why design feels lonely is because every designer has their own process. Every designer has their own preferences. Designers are unique and individualistic and like to do things their way. I think that this is a really good diagram of the design process as we do it today. This was actually drawn by a guy named Tim Brennan. He was an art director at Apple. And in 1990, he drew this diagram and he said, here's how it works. Somebody calls us up with a project, we do some stuff, and the money follows. I feel like this is a pretty good description of my design process. This presentation, for instance, I called up Dan, I said, hey Dan, I'd like to speak at Design Driven. He was like, yeah, sure. I did some stuff. Most of it I did last night. And then the money's following, right? Where's Dan? I make money, right? Um, so what I want to talk about tonight, and something that I've been spending a lot of my recent time working on, is, is what happens here, what happens in the middle, what happens in the design process. Because I think that if we can, as designers, talk about the design process, if we can share the design process, if we can work on the design process together, then we can make design a team sport. So tonight I'm going to give you some examples of work I've done recently towards that end. I'm going to give you some ideas that you can take away and hopefully work with your teams better. So first I'm going to start with a fantastic book, How Do You Design by Hugh Doverly. It's free, you can download it. And in the book, Hugh looks at a lot of interviews with designers and then draws diagrams of what their design process looks like based on the interviews. Each designer has their own preferences. There's interviews with Alan Cooper and Buckminster Fuller and Nigel Cross, and they all have kind of their own particularities. But something that's really common across all of them is that there's essentially two phases to their design process. There's analysis, understanding the problem, and there's synthesis, solving the problem. This is very straightforward stuff. So I was hoping that tonight I could walk through these two things and kind of talk about how I've been working with teams on each phase. So let's start with analysis. Quick shout out to UX researchers, all my UX researchers out there. 
The UX research discipline has made analysis as a team so much easier in the past five years. If you do work with a UX researcher, next time you see them, give them a hug. If you don't, hire one immediately. But as designers, I want to also make sure we're participating in the analysis process and we're doing it as a team together. And for that, I draw a lot of inspiration from another um, amazing feat of collaboration, sleep. Sleep might not seem like a major feat of collaboration at first, but um, while you're asleep, hopefully for eight hours every night, your, your brain does an amazing thing. You have 100 billion, with a B, billion neurons, and all of them work together in this process called memory consolidation. What memory consolidation does is it takes memories that you made that day and it puts them in a place that you can access really easily later. It does this in two parts. The first part is called NREM, stands for not random eye movement, and REM, random eye movement where you dream. During NREM, your brain essentially takes a bath. It washes away all the dirt and grime of the day and it forgets things that it deems are not important. So it can focus on only the most important things. So it might forget what song was on in the background of the grocery store, or it might forget how many times you sneezed, or it might forget if you're me, where you put your keys. And then during REM sleep, which is where you have your dreams, your brain fires these pulses of electricity from the front to the back to strengthen the connections that are still left over. And it does this over and over and over again, moving memories from what's called explicit memory, the stuff that's kind of hard to remember, to implicit memory, which is easy to remember. We call that intuition or insight. So I want to take this process of moving the things that really matter to a place where we can strengthen them and repeat them. And the way that I've been doing that recently is with design principles. So I've been working with teams lately on design principles, writing design principles, and strengthening design principles. So the first part, the selection process, start with a lot. We work with, um, you know, the, the most recent workshop I ran, we, we wrote 80 design principles as a team, just anything that we could think of, and then we added it down. We picked five that really resonated with us. So start broad, add it down. And then, just like your brain does during REM sleep, you have to strengthen and repeat those principles so they become intuitive to us so that as a designer on a team, you don't have to think too hard about how to apply the design principles. It just happens as you design. So I want to share some ways of writing good design principles from my work recently. The first way to write a good design principle is to make it memorable, which is to say short. Um, five words or less. Think different or as little design as possible. Five words. That'll make it a lot easier to internalize. Um, good design principles help you say no. So good design principles will uh, exclude some things. Uh, it's surprising and it's hard to do, but Apple did this when it was designing iOS and it used a design principle uh, that they referred to as direct manipulation. And it helped them say no to a lot of ways of interacting with your software that were indirect, like a stylus. Good design principles aren't truisms, which means that they might only apply to your team. So delight users is not a good design principle. Everybody wants to delight users. There's nothing special about your team that you're going to be the only ones who nail it. So find something that's really special to your team. A good example was uh, Medium. Um, and Medium had a, an early design principle that was uh, evolving over done, I believe. And um, what that meant was they were okay with always changing things, even it meant they, they weren't going to finish some things. And that was very special to them. It's only, you know, it, it doesn't apply to every company. And then the last tip is to write design principles that are broadly applicable. That means it doesn't matter if you're working on a small screen or a large screen, if you're working on marketing or product design or experiential design, you should be able to apply your principles everywhere. If you want to know more about writing design principles, I wrote up a long script for a workshop that you can use. Um, it just takes an hour, and that helps you repeat it. You know, something you can do, your brain takes eight hours to do this memory uh, consolidation process. You can do this in an hour, you can do it every week. It's a, it's a great way to internalize and create those implicit design principles. 
If you want to learn more about sleep or why our brains are really good at this process, here's a couple of books. I feel really nerdy giving out book recommendations during a talk, but these won't be the last. So let's talk about synthesis really quickly. Synthesis, I think, is where the real heart of the challenge is. When you're working with a design team, getting to a point where you're all getting to the same destination at the same time together, it's very difficult to do. And for inspiration here, um, let's talk about evolution. Because evolution is a great way, it's a great example of a lot of things getting to a place together at the same time. And the way evolution works is it goes through two, two phases. Mutation, where a lot of things change and grow. Sometimes they change and grow accidentally. Sometimes they grow because of the environment. But the point is that um, the way we evolved involves a lot of growth and change. Some of it's good, some of it's really bad. But that's why the second part of the process exists. Selection, where we pick the things that work. So in evolution, if, it, if your change isn't great, you get eaten. Or you know, if it does work, you get to spread your genetic material farther. So taking inspiration from this, I think that in order to design better as a team, we need to work on design feedback. And this is a process that I've been working with my teams lately as well. And in design feedback, it's one of the harder things to do as a designer. I think we can use that two-phase process. We can both make exploration safe, we can make it possible for our teammates to grow, try new things, and we can also make failure safe. So we can make it easy to let go of ideas after we've had them. And by safe, I mean that everybody from the juniorest of junior interns to the seniorest of senior VPs can participate on the same level and that they can do the exact same thing. So they can fail the same way and they can come up with ideas the same way. And to do that, I think that exploration should be every day. This is one of the biggest mistakes that I see companies making is they isolate exploration. They put exploration in hackathons or in innovation labs. No shade. <laughs> the way that that puts exploration out of the everyday discourages people from exploring. And then safe failure doesn't mean that, you know, the, the fail fast, like everybody fails, it's great to fail. Um, it just means that it, it doesn't hurt as much. And the way that, that I've encouraged people to do that is um, doing facilitated, consistent, short critiques, not three hour critiques, but to find somebody that can participate in the critiques as a third party to keep things on track, to look at everybody in the critique and make sure that they feel comfortable every time, and then to run the critiques often. So in an agency that I ran a few years ago, we would do critiques, 15 minute critiques. Um, we do them every day. And by doing these short repeated cycles, just like evolution, growing and then letting go of ideas when they don't work, you can, uh, as a team, you can evolve and you can uh, get to that synthesis stage a lot faster. So if you, you want to learn a little bit more about um, workshops on, on design critiques, I've, I've written out the process that, that I've used with my teams here. Um, it's a short 15 minute thing. And it helps to produce that safe, safe growth. Another book recommendation, if you haven't read it, Sapiens is a fantastic book on evolution and why humans are the way that they are. It's given me a lot of insight into the process of growth. So I want to leave you with this framework. Use design principles to select and strengthen your team's memory to make it possible for your teammates to implicitly design instead of explicitly design together consistently. And then use design feedback to grow and let go of new ideas quickly and safely so that your whole team can work together to arrive at the same place at the same time together. So go forth, be a team. This is supposed to be a GIF. Yes. Um, you know, do great things together. And with this framework, I think we can make design more of a team sport. Thank you.
Matt, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have a couple minutes for Q&A. So just raise your hand if you've got a question. And I will run over to you. Um, and one thing I want to clarify, if you don't know that GIF was of the Power Rangers, uh, so a little bit of 80s, 90s nostalgia for you. Do you have any thoughts on team sport outside the design team, cross-discipline team, team dynamics? Yes, I absolutely do. So you notice that nothing I said tonight was about doing anything in Sketch or doing anything in Photoshop or whatever. These ideas of, of analyzing and synthesizing together, of having principles, defining them, and refining them, uh, invite as many people as possible into those. Invite as many people as possible into design critiques. Get as many broad and diverse views as you can. So that's, and that's the idea of safety. So if you create a safe environment, then you can invite people from outside, customers even, into the process, and you don't have to worry about people feeling too attached. Question for me on design critiques. How, do you, how have you run them historically? Because um, one thing I'm always fascinated by is there's always some people who probably talk less than they should be. Maybe they're not as comfortable, and then there's other people that talk more than they should. <laughs> so how do you manage those and make sure everyone's participating? So. Another plug for, let's do this one. You can read this. The, the way that we do this and the way that I've done this in the past is everybody gets an opportunity one by one. You go around the room and you ask for reactions. You don't ask for critique. You don't ask for people to maybe show off how many uh, typographers of the 50s they can name. You ask for people to react and sometimes you can say no reaction, and that's totally valid. You need to make people feel comfortable not having anything, but explicitly saying, I don't have any reactions. That's cool. If you do it frequently enough and safely enough, then everybody will eventually have an opportunity. Thank you. Probably time for one or two more. Oh. Um, thank you for your presentation. That was really informative. I was just a sole designer on a project, and when you said that design can be lonely, I really related to that. Do you have any advice for um, really small startup teams that only have one designer? So I think you're already doing a great thing by coming here. I was, I've been on very small design teams. I'm actually the former design director at the Wall Street Journal. I'm going to be joining the design team at Bitly, which is a smaller startup, but um, I think that, like I said, it, creating a safe environment where you can invite as many people in as possible, uh, there's always going to be somebody who wants to participate, especially people who aren't maybe designers in title. Those are going to be the people that are the most excited to participate if they get an opportunity. So I have this sort of personal maxim, which is default to open. Um, my calendar is always open. My meetings are always open. So I want to make sure that people can participate if they want to. And um, yeah, like I said, even, even customers, <laughs> you know, getting to the point where you can invite them in. Thank you. And probably time for one more. All right, we're feeling a little shy tonight. Um, I'll ask. Oh. <laughs> um, it really struck me when you talked about the um, you know, working or trying to convince people. I'm sorry, let's just rephrase that. So like big CEO of a big, big company comes and says, it's the innovation lab. And you know, you're supposed to be excited and, and, you know, and you're told by your direct manager that no, that's not how things work here. You know, we, we, we're an old 200 year old company and we have a process and the big CEO guy can, get everybody excited about, you know, innovation, but when it, we got to keep the lights on. I, I literally just had this talk today. Um, so, you know, how to evangelize, right? Like your, your own team, your boss as the designer, um, when there's clearly like a conflict of the masthead saying, let's go with innovation, but you know, he's traveling all over the world and you have your daily routine, which isn't as exciting as traveling all over the world. You know what I'm saying? Like how to, 
I do. I do. Thank you. There's a good. Um, there's a good joke, uh, and and it's um, a, a guy goes to meet his friend at the movie theater. and He's wearing a, a jacket, and someone's like, "Why are you wearing a jacket? It's hot in here." He goes, "Oh, my mom was cold," and that is how I think innovation labs happen. Is it's when a CEO or a VP or an SVP they're not feeling innovative, so they build an innovation lab and invite a bunch of people to participate, and they say, now I'm innovative. Invite that person to your next design critique. Invite them to see the work that you're doing and make it obvious to them. And of course, it's really challenging to invite somebody to that level to make sure that they can give the time to come and, and be a part of it. And if they can't, share the result. You know, like I said, default to open as much as possible. Make them feel like the innovation that they're seeking is it's right here. Matt, thank you so much. That was an amazing start to the evening.